Good day, and today we're going to have a quick look at the case of Louisa May Alcott, but more importantly, the idea of 19th century women in America and the reason for their authorship. Now, when we look at 19th century authorship, it's not considered a true profession for a gentleman or for a lady. After all, if you were going to be of an upper-class society in the United States, this shouldn't be a full-time 9-to-5 job. That would con be considered unladylike or ungentlemanly. We also can take the idea of the angel in the house and true womanhood that should keep women in the 19th century in America out of the public sphere and in the private sphere. A lady should not be looking for work. A lady should not be expressing opinions that need to be published. Now, to step outside the domesticity for reasons of ambition would threaten one's reputation as a womanly woman. However, writing for necessity and to earn a living was acceptable for women authors. Not a lady, but if you're writing for necessity, then it would be okay. So what might possibly be a socially acceptable outlet for women's writing if we're in 19th century America? Certainly if it had something to do with religion, perhaps writing for church papers. Perhaps if you're writing for a reform. After all, we're looking at abolition that is coming into play, especially in the mid of, middle of the 19th century. Uh, prison reform, perhaps temperance with alcohol. And with that abolition tract, we can see, for example, Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is published in 1852. Perhaps you would be looking at writing on domestic issues, such as Catherine Beecher's The American Woman's Home in 1869. But most famous at this point in time would be women's fiction, which was also called domestic fiction or sentimental fiction, in which the women were writing about home matters such as getting married, uh, motherhood, how to keep an appropriate home, or they would be writing about religion. So when we take a look at sentimental or domestic fiction, our time periods are roughly around 1830 to about the end of the American Civil War in 1865. We take a look at an example of a story. For example, a young girl might be orphaned or otherwise forced to go out into the world on her own. She will then become a heroine that bodies one of two types. Either one, she is an absolute saintly person. She is an angel in whichever household she is in, and she's quite practical. She's able to do just about any hard work, any labor, or any skilled work. Now these contrast with two types who fail to help or sometimes might torment her in domestic fiction. One would be known as the passive woman. Somebody who's going to be incompetent or ignorant, maybe even downright cowardly. Often this is somebody who has authority over the heroine, such as for example, the heroine's mother or the heroine's caretaker. Your other contrast might also be the belle who suffers from a defective education. Somebody who is quite beautiful, but she is not going to know how to do anything practical. And here in this book as well, the heroine must learn self-mastery and self-denial. She has to be able to sacrifice, but she also has to be able to learn on her own how to do something to accomplish. Now, because it's called domestic fiction, and it's also called sentimental fiction, the sentimentalized feeling is going to give a complete immersion into feeling. And since we're in the middle of the American Romantic movement at this time, emotions are quite high anyways. The novels may even use a language of tears that is supposed to evoke sympathy from the readers. And again, you're going to see a lot of discussion about marriage, either reforming the bad or the wild male, as in Augusta Evans's St. Elmo in 1867, or marrying quite a solid male who already meets the qualifications from day one. Some examples of this domestic or sentimentalized fiction would also include Maria Cummins's The Lamplighter in 1854, Susan Warner's The Wide, Wide World in 1850. And by the way, Warner's book sold well over 100,000, and some sources say over its lifetime, over a million copies were sold. 
And then copies in 1850, when the Scarlet Letter only sold 10,000, Warner's book is outselling Nathaniel Hawthorne at this time. Now, of course, Nathaniel Hawthorne would have a reaction. He responds to his publisher in 1855, quote, America is now wholly given over to a damned mob of scribbling women, and I should have no chance of success while the public taste is occupied with their trash, and should be ashamed of myself if I did succeed. What is the mystery of these innumerable editions of The Lamplighter and other books neither better nor worse? Worse they could not be, and better they need not be, when they sell by the hundred thousand. Now, again, when we look at today, we don't see a lot of the sentimentalized fiction or domestic fiction being published anymore, but there are a couple of works and a couple of authors that we still do see today, such as Alcott and Little Women. She also wrote The Flower Fables, which she had written for her friend Ellen Emerson. Uh, we do see The Little Women being published in 1868. Uh, immediately afterwards, you get Good Wives, written in 1869 as a sequel. In 1870, she also writes the, An Old Fashioned Girl, she writes Little Men, another sequel, in 1871. In 1873, she writes Transcendental Wild Oats, a short story, and a novel work, a story of experience. She continues on by writing Eight Cousins in 1875, A Rose in Bloom in 1876, and ten years later, she finally publishes Joe's Boys. Now, because she was having, at this time, some concerns as a woman writer in 19th century America, Alcott also published underneath A.M. Bernard. And her works would be Pauline's Passion and Punishment, a $100 prize from Frank Leslie's illustrated paper in 1862, V.V. or Plots and Counterplots, The Mysterious Key of 1867, a Marble Woman, or The Mysterious Model, The Flag of Our Union, May to June of 1865, and Behind a Mask or a Woman's Power, published in The Flag of Our Union on October 13th, 20th, 27th, and November 3rd, 1866. Again, not to say that Alcott was not making money or getting fame as a female author, but she was also making fame and making money publishing under a pseudonym or a pen name. Now, if you talk to Alcott on what she was writing, on her children's fiction, she wrote, it was moral pap for the young. However, on her thrillers, she would write, I think my natural ambition is for the lurid style. And my favorite characters. Suppose they went to cavorting at their own sweet will to the infinite horror of dear Mr. Emerson. Thank you so much for stopping by to learn a little bit about sentimentalized fiction and about women authors in the middle of the 19th century America. If you'd like me to go more into Louisa May Alcott, maybe Harriet Beecher Stowe, or other women authors of that time period, let me know in the comments down below who else you'd like me to cover. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. Take care. <laughs>